This is a new day. This is a new day full of sound and light and expectation. This day has been waiting for you. This day has been waiting especially for you to embrace you, to guide you. This day has been waiting with open arms just for you. This is the day we have been given. Let's not waste it. Come now and let us worship together. Good morning, everybody. My name is Reverend Joseph Boyd. And objectively speaking, this might be the most beautiful spring day I have ever experienced in my entire life. Here in the greatest city in the world, Youngstown, Ohio, it is my pleasure to be streaming live with all of you across the country and across the world from 1105 Elm Street. We say hello to all our friends who are viewing us later on YouTube, all of us who have followed us on Facebook. We've had a regular participant from Egypt who's joined our small groups as well as our worship service. And I welcome all of you into this special space of love. That's what we're about. Love of our neighbor, love that is expressed as justice, love expressed as a commitment to anti-racism and anti-oppression, love as an expression of who we are in this life and the stories that we tell. So I welcome all of you, all of you who happen to be seeing and experiencing what I'm experiencing on this beautiful spring day in Youngstown, Ohio, all our friends in Ohio and PA, all of you coast to coast, and all of you across the world in the Middle East, Europe, Australia. Welcome, all of you, however you're viewing us, and we hope you join this community and help our hearts grow larger as a global world. Happy International Workers' Day, everyone. I know some of you may know May 1st was International Workers' Day. And for you who are local to the Midwest or history buffs, you may know about the very important event, May 4th, 1886, the Haymarket Affair, sometimes called the Haymarket Massacre. It was a gathering of labor union organizers who wanted an eight-hour workday. And many were killed, brutalized by police. At the time, the story that was told was all these organizers were anti-American, many of them Irish immigrants, troublemakers, people that were disturbing the peace, rioters. 100 years later, there is now a landmark in Chicago commemorating the Haymarket Affair as the beginning of the eight-hour-a-day right of workers in this country and the spark of a movement which gained momentum internationally, especially in Spanish-speaking countries, Mexico and Central America. So I share this with you because it ties into our sermon topic today, story. The way stories change depending on the times that we are in, depending on what we value, depending on who we value. And we're going to explore that this Sunday, this morning, the power of storytelling that lies in each of us. And the question for the breakout, which we're going to have immediately following the service for seven minutes and then discuss as a large group, is, is there a particular story you would like to record or remember about your life during this past year. We're, of course, not going to have time to tell that complete story in seven minutes, but I want to give you a chance to think about that during this service so that we can talk about it briefly in small groups and then come back and share as a larger group. I'd also like to bring your attention to the website survey, which is also down in the chat box. We're looking to upgrade our website. And many of you have filled this out, and we are so grateful to you. We definitely want to include as many voices as possible in this as we update 
our website, especially for those who are new to our church and wish to connect to us. So you're doing us a big solid um, if you can actually connect to that survey, even if you're not a member, and give us your feedback on our website. It's only five, ten minutes, not very long, and it would help us out a lot. So if you haven't filled that out already, please, we would appreciate it. Fill it out. I also would like to bring to your attention that we have religious education happening this Sunday, and it's happening at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and at noon. 11.30 a.m. is 14 and under. At noon is high school age, 15 to 18, and the link is down in the chat box for you. And meditation. I invite all of you to join Linda Scharf, who is an experienced Tibetan Buddhist meditation practitioner, um, very gifted, and has offered regular meditation to our congregation throughout this time, and really for years, even before pandemic, she's been offering this wonderful way of being present with each other and with ourselves, with our bodies, with our minds during this time. So you can join Linda today, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it will be on this link. I now would like to go to Diana Pilardi with our chalice lighting this morning. Hello. Um, I'd like to start out by telling you um, that I wrote this poem when a friend of mine's father had passed away because of COVID. And um, I think that everybody deals with grief differently. And I feel like um, when people think about grief, they create stories for themselves. They tell themselves different kinds of stories. And um, when my mother passed away, I, I had many different narratives that I created. One of them was um, that line that you cross when you are sleeping and you wake up and your narrative has disappeared in the night and then you recreate that narrative in the morning and it's like being re-traumatized all over again. So I wrote this poem thinking about that experience of mine and I call it grief puzzle. Warm, secure, lingering in the inarticulate particulate of my mind the gauzy shield begins to yield bit by bit. But I want to hold on for longer to linger in that early morning feeling. Then it sinks in my stomach before it hits my mind. Consciousness corrodes, my sense of ease erodes, and then I can't help but put together the pieces of my grief puzzle. I can't think my way out of this, but how do I just sit with it? How I yearn to ease again into that void, but the void does not heal. Heal, Time heals, yet it goes by so slowly when you are piecing everything back together. Okay. And so with these thoughts, I will light the chalice. Okay, thank you very much. Please join me in reciting the covenant of our church. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Each month, we give to an organization that supports transformation in our community, which is the heart of our mission. In our church's historic commitment to the well being of our community, we give 100% of our offering to those in need. UUIO's Giveaway the Plate for May is Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio, Mahoning Valley Health Centers. Youngstown and Warren locations. In October 2016, Planned Parenthood 
turned 100 years strong. Planned Parenthood was funded on the revolutionary idea that women should have the information and the care they need to live strong, healthy lives and fulfill their dreams. No ceilings, no limits. Today, Planned Parenthood is a trusted healthcare provider, an informed educational and a passionate advocate and a global partner helping similar organizations around the world. Planned Parenthood delivers vital reproductive health care, sex education, and information to millions of women, men, and young people around the world. Planned Parenthood reaches millions of lives each year. Planned Parenthood provides educational programs and outreach to 1.1 million people every year and millions more online through digital sex educational programs. Moreover, Planned Parenthood has 16 million activists, supporters, and donors worldwide. Planned Parenthood Action Network enables online activists in all 50 states, including many here in Mahoning Valley, to stay on top of the issues and get involved with campaigns that advance and protect women's rights and health. The Mahoning Valley is fortunate to have two Planned Parenthood health centers, one in Youngstown and one in Warren, often offering high quality healthcare services. Planned Parenthood is well known for providing women's health service, but our Mahoning Valley healthcare centers also provide expert care for men and the LGBTQ plus communities. In spite of constant, consistently offering high quality, compassionate, expert care, Planned Parenthood has experienced funding cuts in recent years. So community support is more important now than ever. UUIO has been a longtime supporter of our local Planned Parenthood health centers and educational programs. And many of our members here have also been active in advocacy for Planned Parenthood and women's reproductive health. During a time when so many need a trusted place to go for healthcare services, it's important to make sure our Planned Parenthood health centers stay here and stay open and know the community is here to support them no matter what. We will now receive the offering that supports the life of Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, and our wider world. Please join me in a few moments of meditation. If you happen to be sitting, you can raise your spine a little bit, not too tense, but make your chest a little bit open to the world. And if you happen to be doing a task, that's okay. Continue doing your task. Uh, just notice your breath in your body as you're moving and doing whatever you're doing. And now we're gonna share a breath with everyone across this country, across this world, all the stories, 
one breath. The secret of the great stories is that they have no secrets. The great stories are the ones you have heard and want to hear again. They don't deceive you with thrills and trick endings. They're the ones that you can enter anywhere and inhabit comfortably. They don't surprise you with trick thrills and the unforeseen. They are as familiar as the house you live in or the smell of your lover's skin. You know how they end and yet you listen as though you don't in the way that although you know that one day you will die, you live as though you won't. In the great stories you know who lives, who dies, who finds love, who doesn't, and yet you want to know again. That is their mystery and their magic. A people are as healthy and as confident as the stories they tell themselves. Sick storytellers, can make nations sick. Without stories, we would go mad. Life would lose its moorings and orientation. Stories can conquer fear, you know. They can make the heart larger. I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme. Some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. Delicious ambiguity.
Once upon a time, what a potent phrase. It reminds me of fairy tales, dragons, poison apples, castles, special powers, and lands far, far away. Once upon a time is a phrase that relaxes the mind just enough to entertain great possibility, imagination, wonder, and daring. The rules we follow in this story need not apply in the same way we live our life outside of that story. And inside this once upon a time world, there is no limit to what a character or a person can become. No limit. It is usually better for the dramatic arc if there is a villain of some kind, some threat, something that gets in our way, something that blocks us and gives us some kind of path. Interesting, I think our modern sensibilities have lost the appetite for complete goodness but we haven't lost our appetite for complete villains. I think we still like complete villains who represent something evil, something bad, but not so much complete goodness. Our superheroes nowadays are both a combination of good and bad. Our brave heroes today are also flawed, prideful, short-sighted, but nonetheless daring and always seeking the good. I like stories. I like stories told out of sequential order when you have to figure out and piece together what the plot is and what's actually happening. In those kinds of stories, you're left with only your senses with the confusion. No way to make clear sense of what is happening, but you're looking for clues, some feeling, impression, ambiance, looking for clues in body language, the way somebody smiles, in tone, looking for some clue about what's going on. I know many people, including myself, love mysteries. There is something very satisfying about following a story that bit by bit gives you a fuller picture of what is happening until you reach that final climax when you discover what that picture is. Some stories follow the opposite trajectory. They begin with what seems to be clear, normal, even predictable. And slowly, it evolves or devolves into further complexity and disorientation. There's more going on than we thought. There are also the great stories that we return to again and again. The ones where we know the entire plot, maybe even the dialogue word by word. We know how it ends, and we immerse ourselves in it anyway. There's a certain kind of stability and continuity in these stories. 
We change, but the story never changes. There is a comfort in giving ourselves over to a rich and familiar narrative. You may think that what I'm talking about this morning are stories in books, in literature, film, TV, opera, every genre of music. There are indeed stories found in all of these mediums. But I'd like to go a bit further this morning. What I'm really curious about, and actually enamored with, is your story, my story, our story. I'm becoming increasingly convinced that each of us is a living story. Multiple stories, most likely, all at once. I'm hesitant to say which stories are true and which are false, because I think a great story transcends the notion of true and false. I think we love stories not because they are true factually, but because they seem true. They seem true to life. They seem maybe even more true than life. I really want to emphasize that word, seem. Our stories seem true. And paradoxically, become more powerful than anything in life itself. Arguably more powerful than even nature, these stories. So I'm not as interested in discerning what is true or false, but as a minister, I've grown more pragmatic about the stories we tell about who we are and what our life is all about. A story that we tell ourselves can dictate the mood, feeling, and experience of our entire life. That I know for sure. A story can imprison us and make us feel trapped. A great story can liberate us and help us open to possibility. A great story held on too tightly can transform from a liberating story into a prison if we forget it's a story. We believe our own stories more than anyone else. Religion, like any art form, is a collection of stories passed down through generations of people who practice living into a particular story. Even our faith, Unitarian Universalism, our story world is a world of innumerable stories. Stories from every religious tradition, scientific discovery, poetry, direct experience. Our opportunity and hardship is to pick some of those stories for ourselves. A combination of the ones that we craft ourselves and great stories 
that resonate and lift our spirits toward what is possible. I think in our modern day, it is easy to see stories almost like food, something that we imbibe, something that we just take in. I think it's very easy to see stories as a spectator experience. We read, watch. But the kind of stories I'm most interested in are the stories that we choose to actively participate in. I can see why it would be tempting to think that stories are not true or false in and of themselves, and a story is inherently created either by ourselves or by others. So perhaps it is most wise to live without any stories. Often in Buddhist meditation, that is one of the instructions that are given in meditation. Notice the stories in your mind and let them go. I think this is very wise. And yet there are Buddhists practicing this who are still Buddhists. Those who choose to live according to a story of an awakened human being in India and the story of a commitment to save all sentient beings from suffering. It's one of the best stories I've ever heard. It's actually one of my favorites. It's a story I find life-giving and meaningful, even though I know it's only a story. I've been rereading Viktor Frankl's book, on a person's search for meaning. And there are a couple of things that Frankel mentions in his book that I had forgotten about or I had never noticed before. In the 1992 edition I have, there is a foreword where Frankel reflects on journalists who congratulate him on selling millions of copies of his book, Man's Search for Meaning about his quest for meaning, being a Jewish prisoner in Auschwitz. Frankel responds to the journalist that he is somewhat saddened and disturbed that his book has sold millions of copies because it shows the great lack of meaning in our culture. All these millions of people anxious to read something that will give life meaning based on the promise of the title. Another section that I forgot or never noticed is when Frankel describes his discovery that being loved and loving in return could see him through anything. Frankel is nearly starved and working past the point of fatigue. And he thinks of his wife, whom he hasn't seen in months. And he is filled with love. He then wonders if she is still alive, or perhaps not. And how he has no way of knowing since she is in another camp. And he comes to the startling conclusion. His love is real, whether she's alive or not. And that is something no one can take away from him. He chose consciously to live in the story of love. Love with his wife. And that story was not dependent on anything else in the world. It was true. Completely true. True for him. 
no matter what. I've come to the conclusion that as humans, we are not flesh and bone alone. We are stories, living stories. And those stories are what make us human. All kinds of stories. Stories of struggle, betrayal, perseverance. I don't think it's an accident that the great stories are always about love, the loss and return of love. The greatest stories turn loss, sorrow, tragedy into something poignant, tender, and fleeting. Something that is sad, but deeply meaningful, deeply satisfying. I do believe, it seems, that 60 to 70 percent of us is water, but 100 percent of us are stories. Even 110 percent of us are stories. Our stories perhaps exceed our own life and are passed down and spread evenly among the earth for all time. There seems to be some direct experience of life, but the response to that experience, the way we process, make sense of, and integrate that experience into our life seems to be the primary decider of how we will experience being alive. All of us have habits of mind and body. Some of us are naturally more optimistic. optimistic. Some are more pessimistic. Some of us have high anxiety and high excitement and high energy. Other of us are more plodding and have a more even energy. And every variant in between. I've come to respect that I think it best not to battle our habits of mind, but to be kind to them and respect them. But I think once we see we have certain habits, the habits are still there, but they don't have as much power as when we assume that these habits are the ultimate and only view of reality, the ultimate and only view of any given situation. I have definitely personally found the great benefit in this discovery. I had a mentor who gave me some helpful advice to focus on taking one step, figuratively speaking, even a half step toward a direction that feels life-giving, and that this is near, nearly always possible. Just a half step a small effort. I needed to hear that. It's not about heroics. It's not about writing ourselves in a completely new storyline. It might be that, but it doesn't have to be. Just a half step towards some other truth some small willingness to enter some other storyline. I remember one time I was really sick, and I was really pitying myself for how sick I was feeling. I felt horrible, and I couldn't shake feeling horrible. And also I couldn't shake pitying myself for how horrible I felt. 
And then I remembered taking a half step, a small gesture towards something good. I reached for a glass of water and I drank it. And it was very satisfying. That was it. I still felt horrible. But now there was also something small. Something satisfying. That partnered with my feeling horrible. It didn't do away with my experience. But it opened me up just a little bit. Slightly. And in that moment, I was okay with living my life. It was okay to feel horrible. Because I knew in that moment of taking a sip of water, from direct experience, there was always something more to the story. A small glass of water. Satisfying. In this moment, we are discovering the power of our collective storytelling. A Hopi Native American proverb says that those who tell the stories rule the world. And we are seeing a shift now in whose sto stories are being heard and respected. We are seeing a shift right now even if we're still in the middle of the story of trying to take in new perspectives, new ways of living life that were always true, but maybe we missed in our story. And we're in the middle of trying to integrate all of these stories together into something that is great. We are hearing the stories that have been kept alive in families for generations. Stories that contradict in a good way how we think of the world and who it works for and who it doesn't. We are realizing what we've taken for granted as reality. And we're learning it's a story. It's a story. And like any story, has its own limitations and blind spots. We see more clearly now how all of us have been living in a limited story. A story we have took for granted maybe our entire life. A story that never really probably served us and never really served anyone. I'm talking about story in the largest sense of that word. Our economic policies in this country tell a very clear story. Our neighborhoods and access to fresh food, or the lack thereof, tell a very clear kind of story. Our treatment of workers and the way we view labor and production tell a very clear story of what we believe a human is and what it means to be human. The wonderful thing about all these stories is once we recognize them not as a truth, not as a given, but as stories, we lose the sense of fatalism. We lose the fear that our life and the life of everyone we know needs to be predetermined in a certain way. We get a choice. And I'm seeing right now numerous brave souls, many of you who are here right now in this moment with me, many of you who are not, many members of this congregation, 
who are living into that sense of choice. And that choice usually doesn't look dramatic or sweeping. The most powerful stories being told at this moment are, figuratively speaking, a half step. Something so subtle, you might miss it. But when you really pay attention, you see that all these billions of people making these small deviations, these small daring half steps into another storyline, has created a movement. And movements create new stories, great stories. But even these stories need to be engaged with, with our entire life. We are not spectators. We are participants. Even our lack of participation is a kind of participation in the story. We are all participants, all storytellers, and it begins with our heart and with our mind. Your heart and mind, your imagination and compassion are the most powerful storytelling tools you have. Believe that. Even if you are bedbound and you cannot leave your house, even if you have no internet access and you have no access to Zoom, your heart and mind, your imagination and compassion can shift the storyline of the entire world. Your small, daring gesture with your mind and heart toward compassion for one single individual, just a thought, just a word, just a half smile, even if you think no one will see it or notice it, the entire world, the entire story of this world will shift with you. You are a very, very powerful person. I mean that in the literal sense. Each and every single one of you is so powerful. Your power is your authorship. How you tell a story, how you live a story, how your life manifests a story that transcends yourself. All our stories transcend ourselves. All of them. Tell a story of how we overcame as a people. Tell a story about a beautiful, fertile earth and all the creatures that belonged to it. Tell a story about struggle, the struggle of all our inherited stories that each of us is living out in our own unique way. But don't end with struggle. Find some depth, some meaning in it. Even if the meaning you find is a small glass of water that will sustain you in your continued struggle, tell a story that is truer than life itself. Please pray with me. Spirit of love, 
We are grateful to be alive on this day. It is a gift to be part of a global community seeking the truth and love. Please help us on this day to open ourselves to the beauty that is present. Please open us up to all that is our life. And please give, give us the willingness to do one small act of service today. Even if that small act of service is just a half smile being kind to our bodies and our minds as they are, please help us to make one small gesture today toward kindness. On this day that we are alive, please help us in our imagination to see all that we are connected to in this moment and to feel that support from every single creature that is supporting our life. All this we pray. Amen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As you depart, Please remember the one great fact. You are loved and never truly alone.
I will go into our breakout rooms very briefly for seven minutes.